have a few more moments and then we'll get started. Hopefully you all got out to enjoy the sun today. It was lovely. <laughs> Everybody's being so good and quiet. <laughs> I should say once the program starts, we will mute everybody. So when it does come time for questions, you'll have to remember to unmute yourself for questions and so on. Mm -hmm. We can be unmuted now. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I don't really have anything to say. It's just nice to see everyone. It I wish it was in Williamsburg, but, <laughs> or, you know, maybe somewhere more warm, like the Caribbean <laughs> council goals for next year. But I am thankful to just, um, you know, I'm so thankful for the technology being able to just see all the faces and yes, it would be nice if we could all be in one place, but <laughs> that will happen at some point. We're we're moving in that direction, aren't we? Mm -hmm. We're just gonna give it just a moment more and then start right at seven. Oh, look at that, here it is seven. So I say we go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, um, glad that you could all join us tonight for our uh, spotlight on formation. Um, just a couple of housekeeping tips as we go, go on. Um, Susan's gonna mute everyone um, um, and make sure that your name is such that if we are responding to questions and we or you raise a hand and we try to call on you that we call you by what you want to be called by um, and not some other screen name um, and and you can certainly if you want to turn your video off you can do so um, but well, we appreciate y'all being here. Um, we have allowed time for questions, and so we'll please ask you to use the chat to, um, to post questions. And thanks to Susan Allen, who's on board with us tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know Susan, she's the um, administrative assistant to the Canon. So she keeps um, all of us on track, and she's going to be our digital guru tonight. So Susan's going to help us um, also keep track of what's going on in the chat. Um, just to start us off, let me offer a brief prayer, and then I'll do introductions from, from our presenters, and then we'll jump right in. Uh, let us pray. Dear Lord, as we gather in this digital space this evening, we ask for your blessings, your guidance, and your wisdom for the Diocese of Southern Virginia during our annual council week. Help us to have meaningful conversations as colleagues, friends, and followers of your son, Jesus Christ. And we, we thank you for the many blessings that you've given each and every one of us and, and for the hope and peace that you provide in these challenging times. Um, all God's people say, Amen. Well, uh, do very brief introductions. Um, uh, my name is Lynn Farland. I'm the Canon for Formation, and I'm going to um, hopefully um, sort of navigate us through tonight uh, for each of our presenters. Um, I'd like to also introduce you to Patty Glowatsky. Patty, you disappeared for me, so... Let me see where you are. Can you wave? I'm here. I'm there we here. are. Okay. To you in Hollywood um, squares. There we are. Yeah, as we jump around in Hollywood Square. <laughs> um, so Patty is the uh, the director of family formation at Eastern Shore Chapel. Um, she's been there October, right? Since October, and and prior to that, had a similar position at Church of the Ascension in Norfolk. And so welcome, Patty. Um, 
Uh, Jane Kiefer, Jane, can you wave to everyone? Hi. Oh, there we are. Um, Jane's a, a member at uh, Old Donation Episcopal Church, and she is one of their sacred ground um, facilitators. She was one of my sacred ground facilitators, and, um, and I just love that experience, which is, is part of why I asked her to be here tonight. Um, also, we have Reverend Genevieve Nelson. Can you wave, Genevieve? There we go. Um, Genevieve is currently serving as the deacon at Old Donation. Um, and she, during that role, she leads outreach and, and mission work. And she also wears another hat, which is the, that of chaplain at ODU's Canterbury Center. Um, and so welcome to our uh, presenters. Uh, I appreciate their willingness to share um, time tonight. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the idea, why we came up with this program idea. Um, one of the things that happens all around the diocese when you get friends and colleagues together, especially formation folk, is that every once in a while they say something like, oh, I just tried this new program or I had this great experience. And then what ensues is just um, all sorts of tell me more questions, right? Well, how'd you do this? Or how'd you facilitate it? Or um, what, what roadblocks did you run into? Or if you're doing it again, what would you do differently? Um, and that's what caused us to say, well, maybe we should do this kind of program um, during council and just spotlight um, three programs that are uh, free. You don't have to pay for the programs. Um, programs that can be led by lay or clergy, um, and just give folks a chance to hear a little bit about the programs and then um, give you a chance to ask some questions. So um, think of this as just a colleague group that we're friends sitting around a table talking about something that um, we tried and, and, um, and sharing wisdom. Um, so with that in mind, um, Patty, I'm going to start with you, my friend. Um, you've been using the Bible Project. You're a fan. You're a part of the Bible Project fan club, as am I. Um, so I wonder if you could start off and just um, share with these good folks um, how you came to it, why you love this resource, um, and, and then we'll take a few questions towards the end of your time. Um, but tell us why you love it. Well, first, I have to give all the credit in the world to um, my dear friend and colleague, Harper Backel at St. Andrews. Um, it was, I don't know, two and a half, three years ago that I was looking for something fun and fresh for our youth who had already plowed through a lot of great Spark House um, and, and other curriculum. They were burnout. They wanted something fun and something that, that theologically lined up with, with their um, ways of of th thinking and believing in the Episcopal Church, as well as just being questioning teenagers. Um, and so she suggested the Bible Project. Um, I went to the website and was blown away. Um, the, the precursor to all of this is when, when you go and look at their website, make sure you've got some time to sit down and really dig. Um, the Bible Project website is like taking me to Barnes and Noble. Know that you're gonna leave me there for a couple hours. And when you come back to get me, I'm not gonna wanna leave. Um, so, so we used a, a, a series called the Shema series that was all about Deuteronomy and the Jewish Shema prayer. Um, the kids loved it. We printed posters off of the, the, um, Bible project website and put them on the wall in our classroom. Um, it generates questions. There's scripture readings. Um, I'm going to share with you guys in just a minute, a brief clip of the video, just cause you really have to see it to become a, um, a, a lover and believer of the Bible project like I am. Um, so I used it with youth. And then back in March, when, when um, we all sort of got shut down and stuck at home, I had a group, um, a Bible, women's Bible study group that wanted to continue meeting. And I had to figure out quickly how to do that online. And um, thankfully, the Bible project came up with something called Church at Home right in the midst of the pandemic. And so we followed that series weekly. Um, the other great thing about the Bible Project is, is it's completely online. So if you're emailing out information to um, a small group or even through a constant contact with your whole church, you can simply copy and paste the link of their website and whichever, um, whichever series you're doing into your communications, whether it's an email, a Facebook post, 
They're a nonprofit organization. Um, it's all free and they give license to do so. There's also lots of opportunities for you to encourage um, whatever group you're using it in. They can go and donate to the Bible Project, but it's all free resources. Um, and there is an amazing cache of them. So with that, I just wanted to show you guys briefly what it looks like. Um, there, are, there are series that you can do with just anything you can think of. So here's their top videos trending right now. It almost looks like YouTube. Um, their latest group series is a thing called Character of God. So each one of these little squares you would click on and there is a video, a commentary, scripture readings and discussion questions already linked to all of these um, options. There's introduction to reading the Bible, um, all kinds of different themes. So I wanted to share with you this video. I mean, you can see how easily you could do this on Zoom. with a group. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. We're going to look at the third key word in this prayer, how Israel is called to love their God. But what does that mean? Love is a very common word in most languages, as it is in ancient Hebrew. It's pronounced ahava. It most basically refers to the kind of affection or care that one person shows another. It sometimes describes physical affection, like the king of Persia's love for Queen Esther. But there are other Hebrew words that more specifically refer to physical desire or sex. Ahava is more broad. So Abraham had ahava for his son Isaac, that's parental love. Jonathan showed ahava for his friend David, that would be brotherly love. In fact, a whole group of people can have ahava for their leader, like when the Israelites showed love for their King David. Ahava can even describe loyalty between political allies, like Hiram, the king of Tyre, loved David. They had good relations, and so Hiram wanted to help David's son Solomon build the temple. These are all different kinds of affection described with the one word, Ahava. Now all of this is helpful for understanding God's Ahava in the Old Testament. So in Deuteronomy, Moses told the Israelites, God showed affection for you, he chose you because of his Ahava for you. So God doesn't love because the Israelites earned it or deserve it. It simply originates from God's own character. He loves because he loves. This is why Jeremiah can say that God's love is everlasting. It has no end because it has no beginning. God's love just is an eternal fact of the universe. And God's love is not a duty, it's a genuine feeling, an affection. So that's all you get. <laughs> I figured if I cut it off at a really awkward place, you'd just be compelled to go to the Bible Project and watch the rest of the video. Um, just again, again, the ease of using this especially um, online is, is beautiful and amazing. Um, on a, just a side note, when, when I switched parishes this summer from Easter, or this fall from Eastern, from Ascension to Eastern Shore Chapel, very easily a parishioner at Ascension just took over the Bible study and they've been doing it ever since there without me, um, led by a parishioner. And, and they love it and all ages that I've seen um, exposed to these videos have really felt that they are relevant to them. They don't specifically gear towards one age group or another. Um, and and there's it's endless. Not only are there is there a giant cache of videos on their website now, but the Bible Project every week puts out at least one new video. They have a podcast. Um, it's, it's just a massive cache of really cool resources. Um, so really with that, I'll, I don't know if you wanna to go to questions now, Lynn, or wait till the end. My email is in the chat. I am super available. You are welcome to email me. Um, I'm also happy to put my cell phone number in the chat or you can email me and set up a call. We could do a Zoom and I can walk you through the website. 
whatever is most helpful. Um, but I just encourage you to use it. It's very empowering to have a resource that's that's easy to use and well received. It, it gives that person in your congregation excitement to to be involved in something formation wise. So Barb, you have your hand raised. Um, I just want, had a quick question. I noticed that video was about four minutes long. Is that basically the length of most of them? Yes. Okay. So Patty, um, Stuart said, tell them about the logs too. Tell them about the what? It says, Stuart, do you want to just ask your question? The tell them about the blogs. The blogs, blogs. That, that come with the videos are just amazing. Yes, yes, they're, they're so one of the great things about this in, in sending the link is, you know, I would send it maybe on Tuesday and it has a whole page of what the lesson for that week is going to be. And at the bottom, it usually gives some sort of extra resources or link to another video. Um, and there, there is a blog that, that is where all of these videos are generated from. So, so the, the videos are pulled from major theological conversations being had at the Bible Project about these different topics. So there's a lot of room for digging deeper. So Patty, Keith, is, um, Keith Emerson is asking, is there a, a, a good study to start with or can you just jump right in? Um, there's so much that I, I don't know that there is one that's like this, the, the bio, this Bible project for beginners. I think it really could depend on what, what age group you're doing it with. If there is a particular theme that you're embracing, maybe for Advent or Lent, they may have something that is social justice driven or that is, um, that is geared towards a certain book in the Bible or, um, or a, a series on one word as, I mean, really just, I don't think that there's one video that you have to do first. So rich in content, bottom line. And, and totally open-ended to, to just fold right into whatever season in the, in the church calendar we're in or whatever um, issues your, your church is sort of looking at right now. If you wanted to pair it with sacred ground, I'm sure that there's a series that is based on um, words like um, justice, grace, mercy, really, really it's, it's totally open-ended, however you wanna dive in. Yeah, Meg, Megan just threw in the chat that um, their, the, their justice video is one of her favorites. Their justice video is the, is the one that Harper said, you have to do the Bible project and you have to watch this video. And it's just titled justice. Yeah, and then Stuart just posted in there about their their reflections, and that's what's lovely too. That you know that, that it just pops up in your email, and it's very easy then to um, even if you're just individually want to do a, a an individual devotion or individual reading, um, they they make it so easy and constantly adding new content. That's a that's a great point from Stuart. Is that so? If you're if you're someone who wants to facilitate the Bible project and you sign up for their newsletter and you start a, a series, they will email you at whatever's new the, com the coming week. So I would get it and then turn around and create it into more of a tailored women's Bible study or youth group email and then forward it on. So it's almost like having a reminder set for you by the Bible Project. Excellent. So, so other questions, and we'll have time at the very end for any, um, you know, to, to go back over any of the programs for questions, but any, any other questions you want to ask Patty, some great comments being put in the, um, in the chat about um, how folks have used them and how they've partnered with other programs. Um, yeah, that's another good point is that if you're doing a study through some other curriculum or some other program, you can, and there's a Bible, you can go to the Bible project and say your study is on love. Um, you can, you can sort of pull their video and supplement what you're already using as well. It's just a great resource. They'll and, be sending and, a check shortly, I'm sure. What'd you say? I said they'll be sending me a check, I'm sure, for my big Absolutely. Plug. 
I, I do think, and I think you, I might have missed this if you said it already, but the, one of the other really great things about it is it, it is appealing ac across the really broad age spectrum. Uh, and that's that's pretty rare to find a resource that that is that diverse in, in that it can be used um, with various ages. Um, and you said you used it with youth initially and then adults. So I've, I've used it from ages 14 to 87. Excellent. All right. Any um, any uh, last questions? Not last, but any questions for for Patty before we move on to to hear about the good folks doing sacred ground? Thanks, Patty. I appreciate you um, sharing your love, and we'll try to get everybody else on their their payroll too, and on their fan club. <laughs> so thank you. You're welcome. Um, let me, let me uh, uh, ask uh, uh, Jane and Genevieve um, to, to talk with us briefly now. For most of you, I, I hope, have heard of the Sacred Ground resource. Um, just, uh, it, it has been around for, uh, Jane, you might have to correct me, I think a year and a half now. Since, it, the spring, and, since spring of 2019. Um, so, so it, you know, when it was rolled out, um, I, I can remember um, talking with the, the developer just to say, hey, how could we use this in the diocese? And then started to see lots of little churches um, get started um, and, and create sacred ground circles. Part of the reason why I asked Jane and Genevieve to be part of this tonight is that um, all donation is on their second round, right? So you're on your fourth circle. Um, so this is not a, a one and done. It is a, okay, now another group wants to get involved. So, um, uh, and I wonder if you would just start us off maybe maybe talking a little bit about what, what drew you, what drew all donation to do this program and then how you began um, to, to really, provide it and, and get folks engaged. And I'm not sure how you want to do this. If Jane, you want to talk and Genevieve jumps in or, um, but, but I, I'm, I'm going to let you start us off, Jane. Okay. So yeah, we're going to tag team, uh, but I will start us off. Um, uh, we originally became interested in the uh, sacred ground program after um, studying through various formation events um, about racism uh, at our church. And there was enough of an interest in um, the topic of racism that people wanted to learn more. So uh, Dan Reese, our co-facilitator and lead organizer, um, really uh, did the work to um, find out what was entailed with sacred ground and register our church in the program. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I, uh, he first asked me to co-facilitate last February, actually at um, Bishop Haynes consecration. So <laughs> that was the first time I'd really heard about the program. So he gave me a uh, a month of grace to decide whether I wanted to do it. And once I delved into it, I realized this was something that was really needed and something I really wanted to do. Dan and I had both co-facilitated or co-mentored uh, education for ministry and um, Right 13 and the Journey to Adulthood programs at our church. And so we knew that we could work together. And that was helpful. So then uh, we worked with clergy to uh, develop the program. Genevieve jumped in as our um, as our what mentor extraordinaire. <laughs> um, more of I think I started as a chaplain. Like this train was already rolling before I got there. Um, when I found out from that Dan and Jane were interested in doing this program, I immediately wanted to hop on board. And so it was. Um, my role at first, because it is a program that is designed for white people to talk about whiteness, mm -hmm. um, and I'm black, I decided that I didn't really want to be a part of the first few rounds. Uh, people of color can participate in sacred ground circles, 
but it is generally recommended for people to of color to wait until a church has like significant has done like a bit of racial reconciliation work already has been has at least like some people who have been thinking about it and talking about it and are passionate about it and I mean, I can't tell you how many times I get like emails from Dan and Jane about all these cool articles and videos they're finding to help like supplement the materials that we already have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so we had intended to start the program in the fall of 2020. Um, and so we sent out um, a, an article in the newsletter and also uh, sent emails to those who we in our congregation who we thought might be interested. We immediately had enough people for two circles and a waiting list to boot. Um, and they were so enthusiastic and wanted to get started. Uh, so we changed our time, our start time to well, mid July. Yeah, but that was because, I mean, everything blew up racial right, feeling wise. Right. Like that was after uh, the George murder Floyd. of George Floyd and all the protests like in the street. And so people were feeling that we need to do something. We need to learn more. Yeah. And so, we had the time because of COVID-19. <laughs> so there were a lot of people who had time on their hands and wanted to do it then because they weren't traveling. So it made sense. And so we decided to we decided to do the program on a um, every two week basis. We had two circles that Dan and I were co-facilitating and we met on Zoom with one of the um, groups. And on when, the following Wednesday morning uh, for the other group, that was an in-person meeting. And we were able to do that through um, the good graces of two of our members in the church who provided the, a, a room that was really well ventilated and um, um, yeah. and available to us. And uh, let's see, and we could uh, work in that room under the guidelines of COVID-19 restrictions. So, and so we started, it's an every, uh, so we were, we're meeting every two weeks and uh, we started in July and we had our last session in uh, the first week of December. Yes. And now we have started two more circles that are meeting on a t every two week basis. So we won't be done until May. So it's kind of like a semester um, mm -hmm. <laughs> for the spring now. Uh, for the first two circles, we had um, eight in the in-person session and 11 on the Zoom. Mm -hmm. And yeah. now this time, I think we have 14 people in at least our circle, which I feel like is probably a little too much, but we've been able to do yeah. some breakout sessions. Last night, we tried doing breakout sessions uh, with having like just one-on-one -on -one conversations mm -hmm. for like five or 10 minutes. And it was a really great way for people to just start talking like immediately. And they were ready, like when we like joined with the group again, to keep talking and just um, like grow on what they had already been discussing discussing about in their circle. Like, these meetings are about two hours long and there is a fair amount of like reading material and films that you have to watch to participate in it. Uh, some of the material gets really, really, um, it's hard to watch. Like you need to kind of space yourself out for it because it's talking about how people of color, um, in America have intersect, like their histories, our histories have intersected with the history of white Europeans. And, and it's not just talking also about um, relations between white people and black people. It also includes a session on Latino. It includes a session on Asian Americans. It includes a session on um, especially like Native Americans. And that's as far as we've gotten so far for me. Like um, we've only done like the four sessions so far. Right, and then there are white identity um, um, histories as well um, that um, many people don't think of, which was really interesting. Um, one of the things, um, oh goodness sakes, lost my train of thought, help. <laughs> Sorry, Jean. <laughs> But one of the uh, one of the things there is a big difference um, 
between the two groups of sessions, we um, the first groups were white, all white, and the second group we have three three total uh, people of color participating, one indigenous descendant participating. And we are also partnering with uh, Grace Bible Church of Virginia Beach. Um, oh yes, that, which has uh, just been the most exciting, I think. Yes. Um, they had seen our work that we were doing on sacred ground in the paper, uh, in the Virginia pilot. And one um, person, um, his name's Rich, had contacted us and he had been discerning about uh, America's racial history for a while and they've done a few um, events and like book studies at Grace Bible already but they really wanted to participate in this program but it is an Episcopal program it's free for Episcopal churches to use um, not the copyright is only for Episcopal so we spoke with Katrina Brown and Phoebe Chatfield who they're really fantastic and easy to get into contact with so if you ever have like any questions or need help with facilitating one of these groups they're always available but they helped us set it up with Grace Bible that they could participate with um, our group so we've done um, so we have like an interracial group and also like an interdenominational group well they're both um, both yes. are comprised of both churches yes exactly both groups are yeah so yeah. they're both like evenly um, split yeah. Um, the other thing I think that's important to know about facilitating one of these groups is that there is a facilitator facilitator training that Sacred Ground um, has. Is it every month or every two once months? A month, usually once a month. Yeah. Um, so you have like people logging in from all over the country, trying like just having questions and talking. So there's a lot of support in this. It's a pretty I mean, it's not um a super easy program because it is difficult to talk about these um it is talk about it's difficult to talk about race mm -hmm. but it is a conversation that our church desperately needs to have it is a part of our church's initiative of becoming beloved community these are things that we need to be doing um and there there's um there are guidelines you do um they offer they say two to three weeks um um they suggest meeting every two to three weeks really because it is such an intense program and it takes a while for the um information to be digest digested and processed also they you don't want to have an overly large group they recommend uh, as as small as four people and as big as 14 as as you did point out earlier, but um, that is really a good guideline because it can be overwhelming um, to have more people. Part of uh, and part of the reason uh, is because you need you need co-facilitators one to do the administrative work of putting things up on a screen, whether it's on Zoom or in in session, and then the other to survey the room and um, and uh, keep the discussion going and monitor to see if there are any is anyone is uncomfortable with what is being said and then you can address issues and it's really important to address those issues as they come up in discussion so, so we're like almost out of time um and is can i answer some of the can we answer some of these questions that i'm just now noticing coming up you, you can take more time i i, I okay. intention i figured that this that you would need more time so continue don't 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 stop okay <laughs> um so i'm seeing that there's some questions in the chat is there a relationship between sacred ground and allyship training um not formally i wouldn't say but <sighs> I don't know, because allyship is for um, LGBTQAI plus like community, right? Or is the question more for like to be an ally for like an anti-racist? Doesn't matter, either or. This is a group that, um, I don't know if you'll actually become an ally out of it um, or uh, like what the group, the program hopes I feel like that you will have like the space and time to read and to watch 
um, like documentaries and like short videos like together. There's also some longer ones. And with you reading and being educated about these issues that you'll be a bit more comfortable to talk about these things and to share this like in your life, like throughout your own ministry, be it clergy or lay. Right. And um, I see a question is said, um, do you do the videos on during the program? Well, because of COVID and having to go to Zoom, we have had to ad make adjustments to the programming. And so we don't generally offer videos or do the videos during the session. People do them. We encourage people to do them sort of like the night before or the or the day of the program. But we, sometimes we do insert a, a video of interest. And last night we happened to insert one that worked really well, which was from this past Sunday's CBS programming about uh, headstones that had been removed from the um, Columbia Harmony Cemetery in um, mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. It, it just, you know, happened and we used it. So and it generated a lot of conversation. Yeah. So you can the, do things like that. Yeah. The cool thing about doing like sacred ground circles, um, like multiples of them is that when you do, when you revisit the same material that you had um, read already before in a previous sacred circle, like the atmosphere, like the political atmosphere, like, um, the social atmosphere of the country is just, has been different like each time. So I feel like you get something different from it. Uh, at least I do each time that I've visited these materials. I see a question is that uh, should facilitators be trained ahead of time? Um, it, it helps if you have had prior uh, facilitation experience with prior groups. It really helped me mentoring uh, EFM to be able to do this. Um, uh, but you don't have to. I know of one group of, um, of that was meeting had been meeting for quite a while that decided that they wanted to form a circle. They had been meeting for years. And so they decided to take turns uh, facilitating each of, this, uh, of the sessions, which, you know, was, that was a really cool idea and a different way to do it. But you don't have to be clergy. You can be a lay person. It's, lot, it, it's very, um, it's easy. The, they give you lots of guidelines. The, we have great webinar training sessions, as Genevieve referred mm -hmm. to earlier. And you don't even need to be an expert on racism at all. No, you right. You can read all these materials for the first time while facilitating it. Because being a facilitator is just someone who is keeping the conversation, like, not necessarily safe, but like, um, uh, because, hold on. A facilitator is someone who keeps the flow of the conversation going and who keeps uh, reminding us of our touchstones, like how we communicate together, making sure that uh, we stick to those touchstones. Uh, sorry, is that? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, one of those important touchstones is to, um, to let people know when you may be offended or hurt by something that is said. And so there is a touchstone that for ouch. And, and if you perhaps made a mistake or you could go, whoops, you know, you feel like you've made a mistake that will help as well. Um, another thing is I noticed when Lewis asked, um, uh, how does it work for different generations? We have had, uh, 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 Let's see, in this group, in this group of sessions, circles, we have a few uh, young people and that has worked really well. And in the prior session, we had younger um, and older adults as well. Uh, the younger um, generation really can contribute a lot to both to the conversation. So Genevieve and Jane, I, I know that there's um, there was one question about, could you give some more information? Joyce was asking if you could give some more information on content or, or resources. There's, in addition to the videos, there's books there are, that are read. Yeah, so there are articles. Two, could you talk about that a little bit? 
absolutely. There are two main books that we read, and you read pretty much the entire thing over the 10 sessions. Um, and that is Waking Up White by, is it Debbie Irving? No. Debbie Irving. Debbie Irving. Okay. And then Howard Thurman's Jesus and the Disinherited. And they're both pretty good books. I mean, I've always been a big fan of Howard Thurman. And um, I didn't initially want to read Waking Up White as much, but I did. And it's very helpful, actually. Yeah. And, um, the, and the, and the, and the um, sessions are, um, they have their own syllabus. Uh, the, uh, they have their own videos, their own di um, topics of discussion and articles. So it's all, uh, it's fairly easy to facilitate the programming. And the sessions can be pretty flexible too. Like they do have a, um, on the website for Sacred Ground, they do have a suggestion for like how to, um, like which um, topics to go to first and like how to get through this session, like a schedule. But um, we've been very flexible with ours and we've actually even included like new sessions too. Like we even included like our own session talking about monuments because uh, two of our previous circles were, Re, um, really interested and wanted to talk and learn more and Dan Reese put together um, a lot of materials that we could read and watch and then um, get together and talk about and process. And so um, learning from that we scheduled in an extra session uh, this um, for this group of uh, discussions uh, just in case there was a topic that rose up that we wanted to talk about. So um, we, we can or cannot do that, you know. One of the questions that came up asks if you could um, describe what a typical session is like. Um, could, could you, and again, they change, but, but just a, mm -hmm. a general idea of the flow. Um, well, since people have already viewed the programming uh, and read the articles, we generally start with prayer, and a scripture reading. And uh, then we group the topics, uh, um, the videos and the, um, and the articles in sort of a, a topic related. They're, and uh, then we have the discussion. We never take a break, by the way, <laughs> because of Zoom and the time constraints, we'd never take a break. Um, and generally, we end up with the discussion of the, um, the two required reading at the end of the session. Peep, uh, we typically have at the beginning after the reading and the prayer, we have an onboard question to find out if anybody um, has anything pertinent that they need to discuss that's left over from the last session, or perhaps it's an issue that they've had in the last two weeks since we've met. Um, we haven't had too much participation in that until last night. We had a really good discussion on some of the uh, issues from the prior session. So um, generally that's the way we have part one, part two of uh, what we consider to be related materials. And uh, we end uh, with a prayer. And there's lots of participation with the groups. Well, that's really encouraged. Yeah, like I suppose our most recent session, we had one last night was about uh, the history of slavery and the origins of it. And so the for part one, like after we had done like our onboard, we talked about, we discussed like, um, we saw one episode, but we discussed our findings, what we had, we discussed an episode of Many Rivers to Cross um, by uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr. It's a documentary on PBS. We had watched one episode of it beforehand. And we had also discussed an article about the hidden history of slavery in New England. And then for part two, we discussed, what was the video? We discussed the video about um, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Pilgrimage to Ghana. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And James, um, and, uh, James Baldwin's uh, article. Yes, and an essay by James Baldwin. And then for part three, we discussed um, chapter, like our reading chapters from the, the chapters that we had read from Jesus and the Disinherited and Waking Up White. However, we didn't have as much time to talk about our book reading last night. 
as we had spoken so much about the movies, it was, they were both um, the films, like they're both very powerful uh, videos that we had seen. Is it, is it safe to say that there's no shortage of content? I mean, uh, uh, having, um, having done one of your circles, I, I, I don't think we ever, I don't think there were ever long voids in conversation, right? There might've been pauses why people just let things sink in, but the resources, the facilitation guides, et cetera, provide um, lots of, of not so much scripted, but suggestions mm -hmm. for how you can uh, approach the situation and how right. you can drop folks into the conversation. Um, Absolutely. But it's okay to have silence too. Sometimes I wish that we could have a little bit more silence because it's a very heavy topic. Right. And it would be nice sometimes to just like sit with it. But yeah, there's a lot of information and people are really eager to share what they've learned and what they're struggling with. Mm -hmm. And yeah. also like all of these films and articles that I'm talking about, you can see them on the Sacred Ground website. I can try. Yes, they have a sample of the syllabus for all the sessions on the Sacred Ground website. And I put, if I put you the were link in the chat, Genevieve. Oh, okay, great. So it, Thank right you. When you began talking, the link to Sacred Ground is included. Great. Yeah. And if you want to see more of the materials that are used, all you have to do is like sign up, um, like sign your church up, even if you're just discerning whether or not this is something that your church wants to do. There you can just sign up anyway, just to take a look. And knowing who to invite, I see from one of the questions, um, clergy can be really, really helpful in this um, at uh, letting you know who maybe have an interest in it. Uh, so we, through our formation events, uh, we had an idea of who was really interested in it. And then Bob and Ashley let us know, our rectors let us know uh, who else might be interested in it? Also, word of mouth. Some of our uh, uh, some of our interested folk had friends that wanted to attend, and it, and and word spread from there as well. Yeah, and our clergy leadership at Old Donation also like wrote about it in articles, preached about it in sermons. I think I mean yes, this program can be done successfully um, with lay people leading. I mean, that's how it is really working at um, Old Donation. But you, whoever is leading your church, um, like if you have, uh, um, I'm just saying like your senior wardens and your rectors, like it is really important for them to say something um, for this to be important to them too, for this to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Jane and Genevieve, one of the things I'm, I might offer, we have a number, uh, just from seeing the faces in, in our um, participants, I know Ascension did it, um, Kathy um, Boyd just put in that St. Martin's did it. Um, yeah, we're not the and, first. Right, yeah, I mean, so it, there, the, I, I do think the, the thing that I do love about all donation and, and is that it's continuing, right? So for those of you who've already done a circle, don't think that you only have to do it once and then it's done. It um, can be repeated with, with, you know, change the group up. Um, and do you think anything's lost in the watching the videos and reading things ahead of time before you come to the session? Um, because it originally was designed that you would watch some of it in, in community. Um, is, is anything lost or gained in that um, doing the prep work beforehand? You might lose a little of the spontaneity, but a lot of people are processors. And so they need time to digest that information. And I really don't think it's suffered because of that. Um, and actually, uh, for a number of people like to review not only the uh, the articles, but review the, the videos as well. It really helps in the preparation for the sessions. So for, for um, if you all are looking at the chat, we're seeing a, 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 just a whole host of other churches who've done it. Um, and and don't, I don't want to suggest that Old Donation is the only one doing it. Um, lots of churches are. Um, and, and it's just a really rich program. It, it is... Um, I would say it's a, it's a it can be a really difficult 
program. I'm one of those processors. And so I would have to sit with information for a while. Um, but uh, it, it's just, it's a great program. And, uh, and the, the licensing piece that someone mentioned earlier that Genevieve spoke to, mm -hmm. um, it, it, you, it, an Episcopal church, it's a licensed Episcopal um, product, but that doesn't mean that you can't invite others in. You just have to have um, an, an Episcopal church that is hosting it. Right, and they are thinking of uh, changing that. They're working on changing that, mm -hmm. uh, according to Katrina Brown. Another thing I'd like to point out is when we first started, when I first started with Sacred Ground, there were only 149 uh, parishes uh, with uh, circles, registered circles. According to the last webinar, there were more than 1,500 circles wow. spread throughout the United States. That's great. And, and That's that great. speaks to what, what Kathy Boyd just put in there, that the seeds, right? That you, you begin and then participants... I, I really, as they share their experience with it, others ask about it and get engaged. And, and that is the, the beauty of it because th there is work to be done. Yeah. And um, so, I'm sorry. Ahead, no, well, go ahead. I know that we have like a larger congregation, like Old Donation does. And so we've been able to like keep populating like sacred circles, but also I would really recommend that if you're doing this, if you want to do this, if you want to make this into like an institutional change for, for your church, I would recommend keeping your groups like small, like don't let every, like don't have everyone want um, who wants to do it at first um, in the first group, like keep it up, keep it moving like through. It, I think it, I think it can really like transform us if we, keep trying to have like if we keep trying to build up like new circles mm -hmm. I'm sorry does that make sense I'm yep. I had four hours of sleep last night guys my kids are sick. <laughs> so I, I do think there's an, uh, an important question that just came up about you know how, how does how do you build trust especially when you have people of color in participating um how, can can you can you speak to that trust building aspect of um especially yeah. when you begin the course well for people of color, uh, I mean, so it, it is made, Sacred Ground is a program that we've already talked about that is for white people talking about whiteness. So it is a safe space for white people. It is a brave space for people of color because you have to be prepared um, to hear things that, and not react as if you would like on, um, like somewhere else, like with people you don't know. Um, like, I mean, I have to prepare myself. I think, it, I think being, uh, conscious of the touchstones and addressing the touchstones at the beginning, what we, we talk about the touchstones a lot, um, uh, which are our group norms. Uh, we ask if the, we feel that there are any additions that are necessary. Um, uh, last, um, for this last session, we put, uh, the, um, the highlights of those touchstones in our agenda, just as a refresher for our group. And they, the they found it, it, they found it. Although, home. Janae and... Go ahead, Jane. Um, so, um, so that helps. And um, initially, you know, the conversation can be kind of stilted, especially on Zoom, but, um, I think people realize that, you know, we're all there to learn how to deal um, and learn how to be together in community and discern what needs to be done and um, that they, they trust the process as, as we go along. But we yeah. have really wonderful participation. Also, when we start with a new circle, we don't immediately start like talking about like James Baldwin or watching like mm -hmm. the Black Atlantic. We start with telling like stories of our own ethnicity and our own ancestral heritages. Um, and that really helps, I think, with starting to mm -hmm. get a group to trust each other. Yeah, so we start important. with like our own stories. That's an important component. I, I keep going back in the chat to Mimi Lacey's question, which was, what's the biggest challenge for the group? I'm wondering about individual feelings of defensiveness and discomfort. Um, I, 
I think my question is, do you, do you have to have a congregation that's already done some, some racial reconciliation work or is this a way to get that work started? I'd say this is a way to get that work started. Yeah, I agree. I, I, honestly, I, I think it can be both, but I think it's definitely a way to start the conversation. And Patty, thanks for bringing that. I missed yeah. Mimi. I missed uh, that too. Thank you. I missed it. Um, but it, th this is also where the facilitators can really, um, you know, with the trust issue and, and having people become comfortable in sharing, um, it, it can be both. You can be further along on the journey. You can just be starting the journey. Right. Um, it, it's just a rich program. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I, we're going to... Does, oh, I'm sorry. Like when it does get uncomfortable, we do have two words that we use. We have the ouch word, um, which people say when you've said when they've heard something that, you know, just gives them a bit of pain. Um, and then they get a chance to explain. And then there's also like the whoops. So if you say something um, and you're like, it sounded better in your head than when it came out of your mouth, then you can just say whoops. It's it's grounded in prayer. It's surrounded by prayer. Like we begin and end in prayer and it is a sacred circle. And we really try to lean into that in our touchstones. Um, so when things like get uncomfortable, like we had a really uncomfortable like moment yesterday and we just refer to the touchstones and are able to like get through it. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I, I hate to cut off conversation, yeah. but, but I do want to hit um, and, and I can, do it fairly quickly on embracing evangelism. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. No, it's fine. Uh, this is all, This it's a rich program and, and um, the difference with embracing evangelism is um, um, I have not done the program. I just want to tell you all about it. Um, so just any last question, we'll take one more question for Genevieve and Jane. Any, any last call questions? Okay, let me just quickly then, um, highlight for you about embracing evangelism. I'm going to put the link um, in the chat. Uh, if you haven't seen this program yet, please, please take a few moments and go and visit the website. Um, it, again, uh, this, is, this is something that uh, came out uh, mid-fall, I believe. Um, just some great resources. The website there is um, rich with um, facilitator guides, participant guides, uh, includes all of the videos that, that are involved in the program. And, and really this program um, looks at evangelism as a spiritual practice, right? It's, it's rooted in um, acknowledging joy and gratitude and curiosity um, and, and, and really learning to speak um, about uh, Jesus's presence in our lives and, and then seeking it out in others. So um, great opportunity. Um, everything that I'm going to share with you quickly here, you can find on the website. Um, they have, uh, it's a six part uh, digital program that was developed between the Episcopal Church's Office of Evangelism and um, Virginia Theological Seminary. It was really designed as sort of a master class. Master classes seem to be sort of vogue right now, but um, where, where you know, you, you're know you sort of immersed in content and then there's a jumping off point for you to put that work to, to that study to good use. Um, if you look at the website, you'll see the quote that um, that says that the program is designed to seek and name and celebrate Jesus's loving presence in the stories of all people, and then invite everyone to more. Um, so each video, each of the six videos, about 45 minutes in length, um, there are small group discussion questions, there are small group exercises, it's highly flexible, so you can do it on a number of platforms, you could do it in person whenever that is safe for us to do. Um, it can be done via Zoom, especially using uh, breakout rooms. Um, uh, it can be um, 
done as a retreat. Um, just so many flexible ways. But the one piece I, I really wanted to share with you is one of their suggestions on the website, which is to use it as a precursor to gathering together again. Um, as we begin to think about evangelism and what we're called to do. So um, love it as an idea for something to be able to do to prepare for us reopening our buildings and, and make this program sort of the kickoff for that. Um, two minutes, okay, what can I tell you? Um, basically each of the six, the six sessions, the, the first one deals with um, an, an overview about the program and really starting to talk about what does evangelism mean to us and I think does a great job of acknowledging that for some of us we're really uncomfortable with that concept of evangelism. Um, then, then you talk about seeking, naming, and celebrating, um, sharing our stories and being interested in the stories of others about their relationship um, to Christ. Um, and then the invitation, inviting others in. Um, you'll see a lot of connection to the way of love. You'll see a lot of the same language in this document. Um, but I, I just really invite you to explore it, um, see how it can be used in your churches um, because it's a, it's a great resource. And again, it is free and one that can be led by clergy or by lay folk. Um, and um, and I'll just pause there and see if there's any questions that I, oh, I still have a minute left. Woo. Um, see if you, anyone has any questions about embracing evangelism. Uh, Lynn, when you, gave yeah. us the, when you gave us the website, it got cut off by a chat question. So could you tell us again, the website? Yes. Let me... Um, let me see if I can. Yeah, as far as just, a physical church slash. Let me put it back up again. Did you get it that time? Uh, or uh, embrace. Oh, yeah, it's pretty much what you would think there. So. Yeah, the, I mean, you'll find on the website uh, a, a great a great video for how to to do it to do the program online. I mean, a great tutorial about all of the nuts and bolts things you need to keep in mind. Um, the only thing you really have to be careful of with the videos is that they can't be posted on a public site that, you know, they have to be used within your particular group. Um, but um, just th there's some great tools and, and the things that are on that page, it's just the starting point. Um, you might come up with a very creative way to be able to use the resources, um, but, but they're well done um, and, the, and has potential for really rich conversation. Um, any, and thanks for letting me know <laughs> about that, that it was cut off. Any other questions? Um, just even in general about any of our um, programs that we highlighted tonight. We sure do appreciate that everyone um, jumped on and um, appreciate your questions. And certainly um, Patty and Jane and Genevieve appreciate you sharing with everyone um, your experiences as you've facilitated these programs. Um, Lynn, I wonder um, if if folks that aren't used to the CNET format um, found this useful, that, that this is something that is done um, somewhat frequently through the, through, through the diocese office that the Christian Education Network meets and has these sorts of discussions about resources that we found and used and have been really successful or bringing questions to the table or roadblocks that we've hit saying you know we're really in a slump and we need some help with curriculum that, that this is a format that that is ongoing absolutely great great point patty thank you i mean and anyone is welcome to attend cnet events um they're posted in the e-news um and um any anyone is welcome um there uh that that is the beauty of it and um and people usually come away with some great ideas and 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 find some real some support systems you know the fact that you all know you could call patty or you could call jane or me or genevieve that that that's powerful to, to know that somebody else is is out there so um please please do come to cnet events we would love to have you um, we are two minutes over time. Um, uh, 
if the presenters would stay on for a few minutes, just in case anybody um, has last minute questions, um, we'll wish the rest of you all um, peace and joy this evening and, and um, pray that you all stay safe. And, and thank you so much for joining us. Take care. Lynn, there's a question in the chat about a link to CNET. Um, just Joanne to answer that really quickly. Um, any CNET um, meetings or events that go on are posted in the diocesan e-news that goes out. Right, they're, they're in the e-news. There's also a page on the website, um, but the e-news and, and um, right now that we, we pretty much try for programs at least every other month. Um, our next program coming up that we're hosting is um, getting started with Messy Church. Um, that There is a fee for that program, but that is in the e-news right now. Um, and so um, just, just watch the e-news. We always list the, the program. And sometimes they're roundtable discussions as well, which was kind of like this. We just sit down and talk, um, but always in the e-news. All right, let's see. Looks like, um, you know, if, if y'all don't have questions, you're welcome to, to um, go on with your evening. Um, our presenters will stick around for a couple of minutes just if anyone has any questions they wanna ask of them. Thanks to all of you for, for sharing how you facilitated the programs. I sure do appreciate it. Lynn, did you all see the question earlier from um, Jim about um, like um, conference groups on sacred ground? Oh, I see it here. I did not. Let me, I, 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 I missed yeah, it. Any, any thoughts on marshalling this power beyond individual parishes? Is this what you mean, Susan? Yes, it is. A broader, more coordinated effort to better racial understanding poorly worded, sorry, a conference of SG groups. Oh, that's a great thought. Yeah. Question. Well, uh, we also have, um, I mean, do you mean like for this diocese? It, it's in the chat, so. I'm, I'm Jim's right here. I'm missing the question. The coordinated march down Dog Street or a coordinated effort somewhere that encompasses sacred grounds groups from a, a wide swath, excuse me, a wide swath of parishes to show our strength. That would be fun. Yes. Um, but I also think that our, I mean, we have the repairs, our diocese has the repairs of the breach um, committee that is our like racial healing group. And I'm a, a member of it, Lynn is too. Um, trying to see if there's anyone else here who is but we occasionally do like really great events like that too. Like we just had that pilgrimage. Lynn, you can talk more about it because I wasn't able to attend. Well, um, so, so Jim, I, I think that the piece that we'd want you to know is that what you're suggesting sort of gets to um, action elements, right? So the repairs of the breach has, has been charged by our Bishop to have really threefold focus. One is education, one is training, and then the other is advocacy. And so um, it takes, you know, an idea like that for us to, um, for, you know, for us to sit down and try to say, okay, how could we, how could we do something like this? I love the idea of connecting programs that are happening um, and, and see what else can, can come of it. So right now we haven't necessarily had the specific question to, a, to address what you've said, but um, Susan, can we copy the chat so that we can save the, the chat? Yes, we are recording the chat and saving. Okay, great, great. I was gonna um, request that. That may be premature given what Kathy Boyd, my rector said about raw seedlings in this effort at this point in time. So well, but, maybe I'm jumping the gun here. Well, I don't think there's, I don't think there's jumping. The, the best thing is asking the question, right? I, I think anybody who does a sacred ground circle comes away with, oh, I have work to do, mm -hmm. right? Um, what, what's next for me? And so I think when, when you ask those kinds of questions of what if, or could we, um, that's formation. That is what, that's what we should be doing. Um, and, and 
and you know I we, we, we um, I don't know what the next program is. I just know that the repairs of the breach group is passionate about um, doing this work and 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 certainly uh, it's what we're all called to do when we look at our baptismal promises. We, we have work to do. And so um, the what if question is great. I don't think you jumped the gun. No. We haven't done it yet, but keep asking the questions. Yeah, even seedlings have the dream of being a tree. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm a snap. Jim, I think it's a great question too. Just when we do difficult work and we feel isolated in that difficult work, I think there's there's power in knowing that there are lots of other sacred ground circles. I mean, with with Jane sharing that that we you know the the growth in a year of up to 50, over fifteen hundred, and just the knowledge of that shared with your individual parishes sacred ground group, um, I think is empowering. So, so I think you're on you're on to an interesting topic of how do we do that without breaking down the, the 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 hard the individual work and the work of the group. How do you build that into a greater circle but mm -hmm. keep the sanctity of the way that it's developed to be really a lot of walking away going I have work to do and how to turn that into we have work to do. I think that's a great point and a good something great to chew on. Um, um, this is a little bit different, but um, I, it brought to mind uh, through our sacred ground training webinars, we learn a lot of information from each other. And one of the most interesting groups that I heard about was a group that meets across state borders and it's cent centered in Erie. And then um, they, they go down into Pennsylvania and they have a large group of uh, but that well groups of groups and then um they they but they are their own entity right and so there weren't enough um parishes to support them or they did you know operating parishes to support them so they reached out to the greater community mm -hmm. and set that up down the road i could see see this taking place on the boardwalk of Virginia Beach as part of a sort of a, a one one day festival kind of sacred grounds festival or mm -hmm. somebody smarter than me make up a name. It'll be fun. I'm glad you brought the question up, Jim. I appreciate it. I'm, mm -hmm. And I'm sorry we missed it. I missed it before in the chat. So it's very I'm late not... getting there. So don't worry. Any other questions that y'all have? Yeah, I got like an hour until bedtime, so. <laughs> Bob, Bob suggested that we speak about uh, an outgrowth, an action outgrowth of our, um, of our first group of circles. And um, that was that um, we developed, uh, we have a scholarship the church has a scholarship for a student at Norfolk State, uh, a scholarship program, I guess, uh, for uh, a student at this point. It's uh, right, Bob, at Norfolk State. Yeah, we uh, we had some people from the first circles who uh, raised twenty five thousand dollars to put into a fund, and we're we're in the process right now of working with Norfolk State as an HBCU um, that is in our neighborhood um, to have a five thousand dollar a year uh, scholarship for a third or fourth year student uh, of color, and um, and it's uh, it's part of our way of saying, you know, we want to not just talk about it; we want to do something. So we're hopeful that the parish will um, really rally behind this and grow that fund even more. And we can do more work of repairing the breach kinds of projects. So for the next five years, at least, we've got a relationship with Norfolk State uh, for older nation. So along those lines, Marlene Bryan, it looks like she's from Grace Yorktown, says, we at Grace came up with over a hundred things that we can do to follow up and keep trying to make a change. So we're trying to keep it going and have more circles. Um, we all have church bulletin boards that we have no idea what to do with sometimes. <laughs> and I wonder if a sacred ground bulletin board with ways big and small post-it notes to just keep adding to and, you know, putting, 
putting naming on on paper and and written down ways that we can make a change. Mm -hmm. It's important work, and so I think it, it um, you know, and and realizing to to connect. And, and, and ask those wonder questions a little bit like Jim did. And, and, you know, if I'm a visual person and I go by that bulletin board and I see, oh, here's a possibility. Um, it, it just is a catalyst for continued action and work. And, and I think that's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. Well, folks, we're, we're like 12 minutes past when we said we would end. And so if, with your permission, I would say that um, we should um, close out our meeting tonight. I, um, appreciate Patty, Jane, and Genevieve. Thanks so much for being willing to be part of this. Um, and, and thanks to all of you who are still here who came and, and asked questions and listened and um, we'll wish you a good night. And we'll just close out for the evening. Thank you. Hey, thanks friends. So much. Thanks, Bye-bye.